Good afternoon, everybody. Let's open this HPP afternoon session. Welcome, everybody, for this one. Even though this is one of the last sessions, it's nice to see you, everybody, here. My name is Pauli Polak, and I'm coming from Finland, and my co-chairman is from Poland, Dr. Snorjewski, and he will actually be happy to introduce the first speaker. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Chirac Desai from USA. Uh, he will tell uh, us about the role of total pancreatectomy and islet autotransplantation for chronic pancreatitis. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and chairperson. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of the total pancreatectomy and islet cell autotransplantation, which we abbreviatedly call TPAIT, for the patients of a chronic and recurrent pancreatitis. So the patients with a chronic and recurrent pancreatitis have a three major issues. The first is a pain and the recurrent attacks of the acute pancreatitis, which requires like treatment, interventions, repeated hospital admissions, poor quality of life. If they are pediatric population, then suffering in the learning and education, many of them, they become narcotic dependent. According to the one epidemiological report of 525 patients with this disease, 72.6% of the patients were analgesic dependent and 42.1% of patients were disabled. And subsequently, when the suicide rate came out, the 39.4% of the suicide rates in America was related to the narcotic dependence. So it's a real problem in, if they get into the pain and become narcotic dependent. Second problem is a pancreatogenic diabetes, which is type 3C diabetes because of the dysregulation of the glucagon and the insulin both. And the 65% of the patients, once they start having a fibrosis in the pancreas within three years, will require some sort of glycemic management and leading to the pre-diabetic or a diabetic stage. And the last is the risk of pancreatic cancer, which is real in the chronic pancreatitis patients, up to 10 to 15% higher than the normal population. And if you have a SPINK1 or PRSS or gene mutations and recurrent acute or hereditary pancreatitis, it can go up to 40 to 45 percent. So when we evaluate these patients when they are referred to us, first you obviously evaluate for a diagnosis and man management plan. Most of them has a medical or uh, endoscopic treatments like a stand, sphincterotomies, and different treatment. And when they come for evaluation for surgery, it's our job to see who we can offer the TPIT and who we can get away with it. So I follow this broad algorithm. We look into the dominant disease when they have a chronic or recurrent pancreatitis. Is your dominant disease in the head or tail of pancreas? If it is within the head of the pancreas, then you look with the ductal dilatation or without a ductal dilatation. If it's with the severe ductal dilatation, then you can do the procedures like a phrase where you lay open the duct and core the head of pancreas. And if it is without, then you can do any thing between the burgers, bur burn, or a whipple. If it is a tail chronic pancreatitis because of, say, disconnected pancreatic duct, then the distal pancreatectomy will be good enough. Now, the important cases are the diffuse disease where they are like in, throughout the pancreas and recurrent acute pancreatitis. So what we do is we evaluate their endocrine function, and if the endocrine function is well preserved, these are the cases which you can consider for the TAPAIT. If the islet cell functions are poor, if it is very poor, then obviously you can offer any other surgery which seem fit based on the disease pathology and the localization. Otherwise, you can still consider for some of them for a TPAIT. So for before evaluating this patient, the two basic question comes in a mind, how much a disease is a real problem? I mean, are these patients are really having a suffering, a quality of life, or they are analgesic dependent or not, and how much of the islet cell function is left behind? So you screen, start with the hemoglobin A1C, which is a glycosylated hemoglobin, which gives you idea of last eight to 12 weeks, how much your glycemic control was. Uh, and then if the hemoglobin A1C is normal, then you can do a C-peptide. C-peptide is a part which is covered uh, pro-insulin, which is, it's cleared with the pro-insulin and co-secreted with the insulin. Insulin has a very shorter half-life, whereas the C-peptide has a longer half-life, so they are more stable to detect, and it gives indirect evidence of the insulin secretion by the beta cells. The normal is between 0.6 to 1.8. If your hemoglobin A1C is borderline, and this is C-peptide is also borderline, you can do a stimulated C-peptide. So you give a glucagon to these patients and collect their blood at 5, 10, and 15 minutes, and see they should be between at least 2 to 4. More than 4 is normal. Less than 2 is abnormal. Do not offer this procedure. If it is between 2 to 4, then you can still consider if the next investigation is good. And that's a continuous glucose monitoring. So continuous glucose monitoring is a small chip which we put it in the subcutaneous tissue, and then at the end of 24, uh, five days, 
we take out this chip and put it in a computer and it gives it load this graph for us. So it gives you a 24 by 7 for five days what the glycemic control of this patient was. And it tabulates for us in how many times you were euglycemic, how many times you were high, and how many percentage of the time you are low. Because it's very important to know about the alpha cell function also before you consider. And uh, this was one of the interesting case control study where you see hemoglobin A1C is relatively normal in this control patients which are red dots and they do not have more than 20% of the time non-euglycemia level. But even if your hemoglobin A1C is relatively normal, you can see 40 to 60% of the time in a chronic pancreatitis patients, you're, you, you cannot be euglycemic. It may be high or low, and that shows that the dysfunction has already started in islet cells. So in broad indications are if the patients are suffering from abdominal pain for more than at least six months with a uh, difficulty in participating in ordinary activities, repeated hospitalizations, constant need of the painkillers and narcotics, if it is pediatric, inability to attend the school, and each coupled with the failure to respond to maximum medical or endoscopic pancreatic duct treatments, or you have a recurrent pancreatitis like hereditary or genetic pancreatitis with more than three admissions per year for two years. It has to be coupled with the one objective finding, so your EUS, MRI, or CT should be showing you some changes of the pancreatitis, or if patient has a previous surgery, then you have a biopsy showing a chronic pancreatitis, or you have a PRSS or spink one gene mutation. Once we decide to do the surgery, the surgical procedure has to be a little bit modified because in the cancer or other total pancreatectomy, you can cut the nape of the pancreas and take the head out as a Whipple's procedure and take the body and tail just as a distal pancreatectomy to make it faster and easier and control the vessels. But if you cut the nape of the pancreas and then still you are working, you induce lots of inflammation in this gland which can be detrimental to the islet gland. And if you ligate your vessels early, then also you are inducing the long warm ischemia time into the islet cells. So the way we do it, we, we start mobilizing the head of the pancreas, we open the lesser sac, we elevate the neck of the pancreas from the SMB portal vein, and then you take, work on the body and tail of the pancreas, cut the hilum of the spleen and reflect it, go around the splenic vein, splenic artery, and then on the top, uh, around the bile duct. So in the end, the gland will look like this, completely mobilized, lying on a GDA on a splenic artery and behind the splenic vein. This is portal vein, axis running like this. And then you give a heparin to this patient, clamp these vessels and take this gland out and put it in a box and send it to our good manufacturing practice, GMP facilities for the isolation. Why? We are, uh, isolation process is going on. Uh, you do hepatic jejunostomy and duodenal jejunostomy. And when, in the isolation room, in a, there are different hoods. In the first hood, we clean up all the pancreas and the vessels. And in the second hood, uh, in the same hood, you put the cannulation into the, into the pancreatic duct and you start injecting the collagenase into it. And then this pancreas is split into small pieces and put in the neutral protease. And then everything else goes in this recorded cell separation chamber. And that's where the enzymatic digestion with the collagenase and the neutral purity starts on this gland. And islets are resistant to it. And intermittently, you take the samples out and look under the microscope to make sure that you're not digesting too much because if you digest too much, you destroy everything. If you digest too less, you leave lots of impurities within the cells. So once the proper digestion is done, sorry, the pellets are made and the pellets goes into this bag with this mixture of the heparin and the albumin. And just to touch base on the basics of the islet biology and physiology, islet is a group of the cell. It's not a one cell. There are a number of cells within it. So they can be of the different size. They make one to two percent of the total pancreatic volume. That's only one to two gram. And uh, they vary in the size between 50 to 300 micrometer. And 150 micrometer is considered as a one islet equivalent. And that's a very important uh, definition to know because every results are compared based on how much islet equivalent per kilogram of the body weight or the islet equivalent kilogram of body weight of a pancreas you are obtaining from this digestion. So for example, these are like a different islet cells. If you take this as a 150 micrometer, then this is only half cells because the beta cell and alpha cell volume will be less in this. So you can say this is like a 1.5 islet equivalent per kilogram. If you compare this with this, so they are two in number, but this is such large, so you can say it's a three islet equivalent per kilogram for body weight because it's double in the size. So once these islets are brought in, we put a small cannula into the uh, splenic vein and the portal vein junction. It is connected with this manometer, and you take the main portal vein pressure in centimeters of the celly. And then, with the gravity, you start injecting these islet cells. 
So the cells will go inside the liver and immediately your portal pressure can start rising. If it goes about 25 centimeters per second, then you wait for some time and then it will, liver will remodulate and the pressure will start coming down. If it goes below 12 and then you start infusing again and you know the end portal pressure and that's the most important thing. It's a long process, it can take a, a whole day, around 600 to 700 minutes, because you are going to do whole pancreatectomy, wait for the cells to be digested, brought back in the OR and injected. This is the only series where the time is so less because there is another way of injecting the cells is that you can do your surgery, you, go, you can go away, and patient can go in ICU, they can bring the patient back into the interventional suite, and then they can do a percutaneous injection through the hepatic, uh, transhepatic portal vein route. But most of the surgeon believes in infusing ourselves because then you have more physiological control of what the portal pressure are. Plus, it's going integrated with the portal flow, and that's more physiological for the cells. This surgeries can be done the robotically also and laparoscopically. In some of the cases, if you get a good uh, recurrent hereditary pancreatitis with sphinx mutations and all in the younger kids, then it can be safely performed. So once this islet cell goes inside the liver, they go in a pre-sinusoidal to the sinusoidal space. So first zero to two, three, 48 to 78 hours, these cells have a lots of hypoxia within their center, so they will start getting cleared with the apoptosis. There is no ECM membrane connection. There is not good neovascularization. So you need to maintain the sugars well because the, anything can jump up and down. Within 48, after 48 to 72 hours, anywhere between three to 40, uh, 14 days, the new vessel starts budding into the your uh, islet cells, ECM membrane clears, and connection is made, and probably the engraftment starts. And eventually, they have to have a proliferation in the long-term maintenance of these cells within the liver. Post-operative care, the three most important things are, we give them the TNF and IL-1 beta blockers, which is atanercept and anakindra, because lots of islets can be lost because of the severe inflammation in the beginning. And then this insulin goal has to be 90 to 120 because you don't want to stress your eyelids with lots of jump. You can give some insulin from outside and gradually win it off when you start getting the low sugars or anything like that. And the heparin drip, these patients receive it. The heparin has two purposes. One is to prevent the clogging of these eyelids with each other, and second is to prevent the portal vein thrombosis. So if you have a high portal pressure, then you anticoagulate like completely for the APTT up to 50 to 60, but if your portal pressure was low, then you just require a slow maintenance of the heparin just to prevent the clogging with each other. Now, results-wise, if you get more than 5,000 islet equivalent per uh, kilogram for body weight from this pancreas, you're likely to get insulin independence and good long-term results. If you get between 2,500 to 5,000 islet equivalent per kilogram for body weight, you might require some insulin, but the glycemic control eventually will be decided by how the engraftment goes. If you have less than 2,500 islet equivalent per kilogram for body weight, then you can assume that this patient is going to require some insulin and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it a little later. These are the, some results from the series. The very first series came out from Minnesota, which was a large series, and they showed five to 10 years insulin independent rate was anywhere between 28 to 46%, and the first large series from the UK came out, which shows at the end of eight years, 10% of the patients were insulin independent. And then they started reporting more results anywhere between like one to five years of insulin independence rate of 20 to 60% uh, in a ballpark amount. And if this is a meta-analysis showing insulin independence rate from a different centers which are pulled out, and you see it anywhere between 60 to 100 percent, but interesting thing, many people don't even report how much is insulin independence rate. This is in the pediatric population. At a three years, you can get up to 41 to 0.3 percent of the insulin independence rate in these patients. And if the younger the child, say five to 12 years of age, uh, they have a better chance of the engraftment, and then you can have a more insulin independence rate compared to the younger child. That brings us to the most important questions. Many people, the first thing when you have an islet related question, they ask, oh, is your patient insulin independence? Is the insulin independence is the only marker of the success or, or say the most important marker of the success? Answer is probably not because in 2015, the Mayo Clinic published a paper on the total pancreatectomies for uh, without autologous islet cell transplant, and their metabolic outcomes showed that 82% of this patient, they required a very complex glucose management or insulin management, and 40% of them had a very bad hypoglycemia, and they had a 3% hypoglycemia-related death. 
And we all know that the morbidity and mortality of the diabetes is not related to the dose of insulin, it's related to how bad the sugars are managed that will decide what your long-term damage to the organ. And if you have a low hypoglycemia or hypoglycemic unawareness, then there is instant mortality because of the hypoglycemia. So this is the CITER clinical electron cell transplant registry. In 2017, they published the data from like world over every centers and they were like more than 1,000 patients. And interestingly, there was no hypoglycemic event in children under 12 and under or adolescents. And less than 10% of the patients had a hypoglycemia, but they were not hypoglycemic unawareness. And there was a zero mortality within the five years because of the hypoglycemia. To illustrate my point further, I'll just show you a couple of CGMs. This is a patient who had a uh, total pancreatectomy because of uh, whatever the reason was. But if you see that when they take the lantus and all, that sugars are relatively okay, but the rest of the time they're jumping up and down, and like some of the days are totally bad, poor, very poorly controlled brittle diabetes because you don't have a control. Whereas this is a patient who has a total pancreatectomy and ILS cell autotransplant patient. This patient at the end of one year of the CGM was taken, and this patient was not, not insulin independent. He was on eight to nine units of insulin at that time. And if you see, the sugar control is so good other than this one day, and it's in the good range. So you know that this patient is not going to get a bad hypoglycemia, bad quality of life, risk of death, and end organ damage. And that's the most important because the, the indication was for the quality of life uh, and prevention of the other problems. But, and there is enough data in the literature that the quality of life significantly improves after this procedure. And if you can see that most of the patients reported that 70% of the patients no longer require narcotics within the one year. It's very hard to get off the analgesic if these patients were getting, but 70% is a good number. And if you see that uh, first within three months, the pain score came down to like from 5.5 to 2.5. Uh, so it's a significantly good quality of life. Factors which influence outcomes are obviously number of islet equivalent, we spoke about it. Duration of the disease, if it is more than seven years, then you're probably a poor outcome. Moderate to severe fibrosis and severe retinal atrophy will decide. Hereditary and genetic pancreatitis, you can have probably a good outcome because they have a recurrent attacks rather than a fibrosis generating if you do it in right time. Previous surgery, so if you have a previous pustose or a phase or a distal pancreatectomy, then you don't get much islet and the digestion becomes very difficult. If you have a hivipal from the tail of the pancreas, because islets are predominantly located in the tail, so you can still get a great outcome. And the my lab works on a liver pathology, so if your liver is steatotic or fibrotic, then you are going to have lots of inflammation in the beginning when you are infusing the cells and they can kill the cells and they'll have less cells for engraftment and they will have a poor results. And just to work some point, I'm just going to go over some of the cases uh, which we select and how they work for it. The first case is a 30-year-old lady who had a pancreatic division, and she was an Olympic extrian. She was trying for it, and uh, she started getting these recurrent attacks. They did endoscopic treatment. She had a 17 stance, and she started going to like every weekly for uh, some hydration and the IV pain medications, the uh, ER. She comes after like three years to us. And with all the risk and benefits explained to her, we do this autologous islet cell transplant on her. She's, she got a 5,532 islet equivalent per kilogram for body weight. And she's completely insulin independent at the end of five years now. And she's back and on horse. This is a patient who has a severe calcification in the pancreas. Hemoglobin A1C was already rising 6.4, 47-year-old guy with the two kids. And uh, we know that we are not going to get him insulin independent, but he's narcotic dependent, no more hopes. So we took his pancreas out. We got only 2,370 islet equivalent. He is the guy at the end of the one year, the CGM which you saw with the very good control over the patients. This is an interesting case of another extending indications, 20-year-old girl who had a pancreatic cystosis. So whole pancreas was replaced because of the pancreatic cyst, and that's because of the CF. She had no exocrine function. For three to four years, every two to three months, the endoscopist was doing a EUS and aspirating this cyst to decompress them and make her feel better. And she was turned down by many centers for, at the risk of not getting into her eyelids. Rightly so. She comes to us with a gallbladder perforation. We do a conservative treatment and we uh, stabilize her. Then we talk. I observed her for one year before offering this surgery. She was a graduate student from our own university. And uh, 
she says that, look, I can't go on like this. This pancreas has to be out. I can't go like every three months and all. So with all the risk, we did autologous islet cell transplant, took out the pancreas in toto, and to our surprise, that whatever was in a septa was only islets, and she ended up getting a 5,900 islet equivalent. She's one and a half year out now, and she was about to graduate. This is a 12-year-old guy at the age of two years, gets a pseudocyst and get drained. Then he had a distal pancreatectomy, and again, the same story, over a period of 10 years of suffering, we get a very little islet, 1,356, and uh, he's on insulin, but still having a good glycemic control. And this is a very recent case of uh, idiopathic pancreatitis, which is a 45-year-old lady who had also sim similar uh, correction. The diagnosis is confusing between autoimmune and not autoimmune, and all the treatment has failed for years, and she ends up getting a many case. So the, the issue was the role of the pancreatitis, the uh, role of the TPAIT. Now many centers, they are predominantly islet cell transplant centers, so they don't differentiate between the, this surgery versus islet surgery. Many other centers are only chronic pancreatitis surgery. What we do this approach is to filter these patients whom we can give and not give it. So I moved to UNC in 2016, so last three years, and like last two years, the program has been active. And if you can see, to summarize, around 32 patients were referred actually for this case, and we could get away with surgery in most of them, except 11 patients. Only 34%, maybe roughly one third of the patients who are actually referred for this surgery may be a good candidate for the surgery. And this is my personal experience over the last seven years period. So we have done a selectively 37 cases with insulin independence rate of 37.8. So in summary, it's a, uh, CP, some of the patients and recurrent acute pancreatitis is a very complex disease. The surgical treatments have a better long-term results, that's undisputed. Timing of the surgery is critical to the success. If you do too early, it's not good. Too late, it's also not good. TPI should be very carefully thought of and considered in these patients. And then there are lots of research prospects, like a function of the alpha cells, environment uh, improvement for the islet cells into the liver, and in influence of the altered physiology on glycemic control, like for hepatic jejunostomy, gastro jejunostomy, what that has to play, we don't know in the detail, and we can research more about it. And this I thank to all my patients. This is the lady, she's back on her horse now. This is a UNC graduate student. Uh, she is getting uh, like a degree and then going for us uh, for the th studies next year. This is a little bit overdoing. She got operated on 18th June. She got discharged. She feels so good after many years. She goes for this amusement park, and I'm going to be back on the weekend. Hopefully, she's not readmitted with the dehydration, but we'll see. But she is also insulin independent. With that, I'll take some questions, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for excellent presentation and congratulations for the results. It's Thank very you. impressive. Uh, now we open the discussion. Any questions or comments from the audience? Please. Not, I, I have one question. Uh, you said uh, in the beginning uh, that um, pancreatic yield uh, has a direct impact on the outcome. Uh, so uh, this resection after this uh, resection, um, it is difficult to, to achieve a proper amount of beta cells. But you, you showed in your results that you, you operated on the patients after distal resection, and they, they still can have a chance for good control of, of glycemia. So we got only 1,376, and the control was good. Probably the kid, 12 year old. One thing we don't, the biggest problem in the islet cell transplant is the long-term maintenance of the multiplications of these cells. We have not figured out. Now, there are various theories, and that's why now currently there is a grant going on with cocon transplant with the stem cells. But there are lots of impurities we left behind, like usually 20 to 30% impurities you left behind are a biliary and the ductal epithelium, which is a biliary and ductal stem cells. If they are multiplying this in a pediatric population or no, I don't know how to even look into it for between the two patients, but that is my hypothesis. So probably in children is uh, easier to get uh, yeah. better results. Young, young children, like around uh, children. five, 12 years old. Yeah. yeah, I think you really ought to be congratulated for putting this program on in a, just a couple of years of time. So it, it is, it's going to be good. Uh, have you ever had any problems with uh, uh, portal vein thrombosis? No. Okay. So that's a very important thing. What we do is we do the, all the patient's hypercoagulable workup, 
And uh, if I get more than 12 centimeters per second of uh, 12 centimeters of a portal pressure, then I anticoagulate them very heavily. So if you see, I'll not hide this, if I have a, like a reoperation, uh, sorry, oh, it's not showing the slide, but uh, I had a 5.4% of the reoperation rate because of the bleeding, which I do not have it for other pancreatic or liver resections. So that's a little high percentage. So I took the bleeding over the clotting. And we are infusing all from a splenic vein stem. The, the centers which are getting into the problem with the portal vein thrombosis are predominantly injecting through a transhepatic route into the portal vein. So it's an additional procedure, and you are putting the cells against the portal flow, and that causes probably more risk of thrombosis. Excellent answer. Actually, the, uh, there was a reason for me asking this. In the mid-'80s, we were trying to do this thing with the pigs, and they all died of the thrombosis, yeah. so we didn't know what to do at that time. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from the floor? If not, thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll move along. And the next talk, uh, the speaker comes from Japan, Professor Maurice. He is talking about the role of the surgeon in interventional HPP endoscopy. Please. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about the role of the surgeon in interventional HPV endoscopy. It's a little bit difficult to talk about that for me. But anyway, uh, let's get started. There is no CUI for this presentation. I think uh, I'm going to start with the history of interventional HPV endoscopy. Uh, this is a kind of prehistory, endoscopic access to HPV system, ELCP, endoscopic retrograde coronal pancreaticography, was first reported in 1968. That, that report was in Annals of Surgery. This is Surgical Journal by Dr. McCune. In this report, you can look like this photo. Uh, this is a little bit different from the current form of ELCP because they, are, they were using direct viewing endoscope and the success rate was 25%. And I think this is the first report of current form of ELCP. Dr. Oi developed a side viewing fiber optic duoden scope with a channel and an elevator lever to enable manipulation of the cannula. Uh, he was in close co collaboration with the Machida and Olympus Corporation. This report was reported in 1970 in surgery, also in surgical journal. So, what was the first intervention, actual intervention in HPV endoscopy? I think this is the one. EST, endoscopic sphincterectomy. Uh, this was reported 1974 simultaneously from German and also from Japan. Uh, they were using the techniques of ERCP plus the technology of high-frequency cutting device for polypectomy. Uh, they, do, they did EST and do the extraction of stones from common bile duct. And ERBD, endoscopic retrograde biliar drainage, followed 1979. Uh, you can see this photo. This is from this first paper. You can see this almost same to the current form of uh, drainage tube insertion uh, from this report. However, this was 10 years de delayed to PTBT, Park Tunnels Transhepatic Burial Drainage, that was reported in 1969. This is not an endoscopic intervention, but uh, IVR, interventional radiology. After then, ERBD 
techniques was advanced and can be widely used with the developments of, for example, balloon endoscopy and also expandable metallic stents. Balloon endoscopy was used for post-operative condition uh, after gastrectomy, period two, Lou and Y deconstruction patient. Exp expandable metallic stent, EMS, was used for biliary structure from malignancy and also benign structure. On the other hand, EUS endoscopic ultrasonography was first reported in 1980, uh, around 10 years behind ERCP in Lancet. EUS guided fine needle respiration biopsy in pancreatic disease and also EUS uh, guided pancreatic cyst, cyst drainage uh, followed in 1991 and 1992. So this can make change the treatment for pancreatitis and pancreatic diseases. I'm talking about acute severe pancreatitis. Uh, in Atlanta classification 2012, uh, acute severe pancreatitis was divided into two categories, interstitial edematous pancreatitis and necrotizing pancreatitis. Also, each of them were, was also divided into two categories, acute peripancreatic fluid correction, APFC, and pancreatic pseudocyst. Uh, necrotizing pancreatitis was divided to acute necro necrotic correction, ANC, and ward of pancreatic necrosis, one. Both are uh, divided depending on the time from the onset, four weeks. For these kind of condition, pancreatic cyst and ward of pancreatic necrosis, we can use uh, Endoscopic, endoscopic ultrasonography technique. However, maybe 20 to 25 years before then, we are doing this. Actually, this is my own paper. We did direct retroperitoneal open drainage via long posterior ovary incision. We got the direct access to retroperitoneum this is not open abdomen, not opening the abdomen, not at all, but uh, it's minimally invasive, but uh, we do operation for that. And uh, in the same period, the other group reported this paper in Annals of Surgery, Park Tunnels, ne Necrosectomy, and Sinus Tract Endoscopy in the Management of Infected pancreatic necrosis. This is uh, endoscopy sinus. And uh, we are doing, we were doing this kind of operation and uh, management for necrotic pancreatic, necrotizing pancreatitis with infection 20 years ago or 25, 30 years ago. But right now, we have new tool for develop, uh, management for that kind of condition that is US-guided pancreatic cyst drainage. Uh, they are reported in 1992. This is example. 63 years old man developed alcoholic acute necrotizing pancreatitis with necrosis of pancreatic body and spirit of pancreatic juice. Necrosis of pancreatic body here and uh, he got uh, kind of palm peritonitis with a spirit of pancreatic juice, and we got emergency resection of necrotic pancreatic body plus pancreatic head stump closure and pancreatic gastro gastrosomy of pancreatic tail. It was good. He got well, but four years after then, he got the stenosis of anastomosis uh, here you can see th there's stomach and the pancreatic tail. There's a big pancreatic shoe cyst. 
So in this time, we did endoscopic ultrasonography guided puncture to the shoe cyst and uh, guide wire insertion and uh, also insertion of uh, drainage tube under the EUS. So he got well, and 10 years after then, he is now well and uh, with uh, under, con under good condition. Maybe uh, he should do the pancreatic eyelid cell transplantation. He is now under insulin control, but uh, he's well. Also, there is uh, another drainage, US guided biliary drainage, not ERBD. 2001, this uh, technique was reported. There's three kinds of technique. Uh, from duodenum, uh, from duodenum to common bile duct, there's a US guided corridor duodenal stomy, and uh, from stomach to hepatic, common, uh, hepatic bile duct, US guided hepatic stomy and also direct drainage from duodenum to gallbladder. This uh, kind of drainage technique was developed under US, and then US technique was expanded from drainage to injection. Injection to, uh, for the treatment for several conditions. This is the endoscopic intervention for visceral pain control. Usually this is uh, used for uh, pancreatic cancer pain or something. U.S. Uh, celiac plexus neurolysis, U.S. Uh, celiac ganglia neurolysis. These were reported in 1996. Injection therapy of drugs introducing neurolysis. The catheter was introduced through the endoscope, uh, echoscope channel, localizing celiac plexus or ganglia under EUS guidance. Here, introduce the catheter and inject the neurolysis drugs. And also, there's a brachiotherapy, local injection of radiation sources. It was reported in 2006, U.S. guided interventions for local control of treatment of tumors. And also, there is report 2012 and 2013, ablation therapy under U.S. guidance. Alcohol injection, radio frequency ablation, cryo ablation. This kind of ablation therapy is also uh, handled under the EUS guidance. So, after that, uh, kind of novel advanced interventional endoscopy for tumor was developed, reported. Lex, do you know Lex? Laparoscopic and endoscopic cooperation surgery, cooperative surgery. This was reported in 2008, surgical endoscopy by Dr. Hickey. Uh, this was actually not HPV tumor, but uh, for this kind of uh, submucosal tumor in stomach, he used this kind of technique. Uh, from endoscopic side and uh, laparoscopic side coordinatory, they reject the tumor wall, full thickness of tumor wall, and remove the tumor, and after that, they close the hole on the uh, stomach wall by laparoscopic staple. This is Rex. And also, maybe you know, notes was reported for human first in 2007 in archives of surgery by uh, Dr. Marsko. This report described cholecystectomy uh, was performed by transvaginal, natural orifice, transluminal endoscopic surgery. This kind of development was performed in the endoscopic treatment. And uh, 
in this time point, I want to talk about lab liver resection. Actually, I'm a lab liver surgeon, main, uh, liver surgeon mainly doing lab liver surgery, so I want to talk about this. HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma patient has background chronic liver disease and have high risk of post-operative liver failure. For these, those patients, limited small resection is usually applied because of the low malignant potential of hepatocellular carcinoma without vessel invasion, uh, portal thrombus, and other things. Without th those conditions, hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, kind of a lower uh, malignant potential, so we choose uh, limited small rejection. Even then, some patients are out of indication of liver rejection due to liver function. For example, this patient, 69 years old women with hep B liver cirrhosis without treatment history got emergency admission with this kind of massive ascites. At that time, her child poo score is C10, and that turned to V8 after the treatment in Department of Internal Medicine, and she underwent the lab prevention for this HCC tumor. She was usually out of indication of liver resection due to poor liver function. However, this is the video from operation, uh, very atrophic and cirrhotic liver here, and the uh, tumor is here. You can see the subphrenic vessels here. So this area has the root of hepatic vein and I will see very close to the root of hepatic veins. So in this situation, we should do in open surgery, we should get, we should get the big subcostal incision and the whole way dissection on the retroperitoneum and mobilization of the river and get this small resection for open surgery. But in laparoscopic surgery, we can get this kind of access to the tumor, direct access to the tumor without dissection of retroperitoneum. You can see the, a large number of collateral veins here. We preserve this kind of collateral veins and collateral lymphatic flow. And without that kind of dissection and incision, we can get the direct uh, access to the tumor and uh, get the small uh, rejection of the tumor without the damage around the, around the uh, without the damage to the structures surrounding these tumors. Just we dissect the tumor without the damage to the liver and other collateral vessels and other things. Operating time was uh, 112 minutes and the bleeding amount was 20 minutes. She was well. And for this kind of patient, Short-term outcomes of surface lab liver resection for HCC with chronic liver di disease was compared among the patients severe, ICGR 15, 40, uh, over 40 percent, and the child pill B and C patient to mild to moderate patient. This is a short-term outcome, but uh, there is no statistical significant difference was there. Uh, for this patient is in kind of contraindicated patient. However, we can get this, we could get this kind of result for that kind of operation. The character, again, the characteristics of lab liberalization, the subphrenic space is the cage with a river inside. River is protected in this rib cage Liver resection is the procedure performed in this cage, but uh, in open liver resection, it's done by opening up the cage with a big subcostal incision and picking up the liver with mobilization. However, on the other hand, in lab liver resection, a laparoscope and forceps intrude into the cage directly from the caudal direction and can obtain a good vision 
and manipulation in a small operating field. That is good, I think. This is a kind of narrow access surgery, uh, similar situation like endoscopic intervention. So, I think minimum damage on surrounding structure and residual river, uh, such as collateral vessels in uh, river cirrhosis, can make severe cirrhotic patient to undergo tumor resection possible. Also, we have several instru instruments for narrow access surgery right now. This is Da Vinci SP system, and also this is a kind of a little bit old one, and Samurai by Olympus. We have this kind of, these kind of instruments for narrow access surgery. So I hope things will be changed, get to the new world. Uh, ERCP was first reported 1968. ESD 1974, ELBD 1978 followed. EUS was first reported 1980. EUS drainage, guided drainage for pancreatic 1992, biliary 2001. EUS regional therapy, analgesia 1996 for tumor treatment, 2006 followed. Lex was reported 2008, Notes was reported 2007. And after half century from the beginning, I hope we are going to novel trans-endoscopic minimal invasive therapy for several conditions. Interventional HPV endoscopy have been advanced based on the coordination of surgical endoscopic procedure and technolo technological developments. The coordination of surgical and endoscopic procedure, surgeon and also endoscopic doctors, and also technological developments should make novel minimal invasive treatment for various diseases possible, I hope. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for this very exciting overview. If we think about the title of the talk, so how is it in Japan? Is any of the ERCPs done by a surgeon? Yeah, uh, right now, the performing ERCP by surgeon is uh, decreasing, I think. Uh, because that the technique is uh, more complicated and complicated, so uh, special, special endoscopist for that kind of technique, uh, getting a large amount of patient. And uh, we sometimes do ERCP and other te techniques, but uh, not so much okay. in Japan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions from the floor? I have one, one short question. Uh, you talked about um, US guided procedures like RFA. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you about your, your personal point of view. What are the indications uh, uh, for such um, procedures in pancreatic uh, small tumors uh, like neuroendocrine tumors or cystic tumors? Is there any place for for, for RFA, use guided. Yeah, actually, actually, I'm surgeon, so I, I'm going to reject that kind of tumor. Also, uh, in the liver tumor, we can do maybe we can do that. This, but uh, we usually do the rejection for liver tumor. But uh, in HCC patient, they have. Uh, I show you in this presentation, uh, sometimes they have a very poor liver function. In that case, uh, that will be one choice. And for pancreatic cancer, if they have uh, some contraindicated condition of surgery, it's a kind of choice. But if we can reject, I'm going to reject. Okay, if there's no more comments, then we'll just move along. We are, we, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.
And we are actually precisely in time, which is good. Now we are moving to the last part of the session, which is something like a bit novel, uh, kind of a concept in these meetings. It, it involves a debate. And now the title is The Endoscopic versus Surgical Approaches to Pancreatic Necrosis. And the first uh, views is going to be presented by uh, uh, Dr. Law from the United States. Please. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation um, to present on this topic. And I look forward to um, uh, the counter arguments and subsequent discussion moving forward. Here are my disclosures. So I think it's best to start with a base case presentation. Um, in this case, we have a 49-year-old male with past history of hypertension, complete AV block with a pacemaker implanted, and neurofibromatosis who presented with acute necrotizing gallstone pancreatitis and immediate imaging showing necrosis of greater than 50% of the gland. He um, subsequently underwent ERCP the following day after presentation due to biliary obstruction and cholangitis with stone removal, uh, sphincterotomy, and biliary stent placement. He recovered, was discharged home, and was planned for an interval cholecystectomy. However, he subsequently presented four weeks later with abdominal pain and sepsis, um, and a repeat CT of the abdomen was performed. Here you see both the axial and coronal views uh, demonstrating a large area of uh, necrosis surrounding the pancreas as well as um, involving much of the mid-abdomen. So he was found to have two adjacent areas of Waldorf necrosis. There was a smaller organized collection near the head of the pancreas and then a larger organized collection that abuts the greater curvature of the stomach and the spleen with extension into the left paracolic gutter. So at this point, we have options of, of calling a surgeon for surgical intervention uh, or pursuing um, endoscopic intervention. And over the next several minutes, I would like to um, convey the data and uh, my opinion as to why endoscopic intervention should be pursued. So the earliest high quality data on this topic uh, comes from the Dutch pancreatitis study group who performed the PANTHER trial, um, which was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. And this was a randomized controlled trial of 80 patients who were randomized either to open necrosectomy or a step up approach, which included percutaneous drainage, um, subsequently followed by minimally invasive uh, necrosectomy, either surgical or endoscopic. Uh, the primary endpoint was death and adverse events, and the step-up approach showed a 40% um, risk of death and adverse events compared to nearly 70 in open necrosectomy. Uh, the rate of death alone showed no difference between the two groups, but the difference uh, mainly came from uh, multi-system organ failure, uh, which occurred much more frequently in the open necrosectomy group. They followed this study up with recent uh, publication in Gastro um, in which they evaluated 77 uh, patients of the, of the uh, original 88 patients who were still alive with a mean follow-up of 86 months, showed a lower proportion of both endocrine and exocrine insufficiency in the step-up group. There was no difference noted in the step-up group versus open necrosectomy regarding additional drainage, need for pancreatic surgery, or recurrent acute pancreatitis, however. Additional studies uh, then compared endoscopic versus surgical step-up um, uh, intervention. The endoscopic uh, intervention, which, which initially was proposed, was um, drainage either with EUS or non-EUS guidance, followed by uh, entry into the uh, cystic um, area, either necrosis or pseudocyst, subsequent dilation of the cyst gastrostomy tract and placement of uh, often double pigtail stents. Um, in the surgical approach, this was uh, usually um, minimally invasive with uh, endoscopic intervention or, or video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement. In a pooled analysis of 1,980 patients, there was a lower risk of death compared to a minimally invasive and um, open surgery. 
Uh, there's also randomized control trial data which demonstrated a decreased major adverse events and death with the endoscopic approach compared with surgical necrosectomy with a fourfold uh, increase in major adverse events uh, and death in the surgical group. Um, the lower risk of death was most evident in this particular randomized trial uh, in the high risk and very high risk patients um, with development of multi-system organ failure occurring in 50% of the surgical patients and none of the endoscopic patients. Also, there was decreased rate of pancreatic or cutaneous fistula formation, 16 fewer days in the hospital, and a mean number of endoscopic interventions of three. After we've shown that endoscopic intervention appears to be superior to surgical intervention, um, we subsequently compared um, our approach using the traditional double, pla double pigtail plastic stent uh, approach to large caliber metal stents. Um, the placement of large caliber metal stents minimized procedural steps necessary during both the index and subsequent uh, intervention procedures. Um, and compared to plastic stents, the use of large caliber metal stents reduced the number of procedures to cyst resolution and reduced the need for direct endoscopic necrosectomy. Um, in a paper uh, out of the Mayo Clinic, there was resolution in necrosectomy of 60% of patients who had metal stents compared to 30% of patients with plastic stents. When we talk about metal stents, there's two varieties. Um, uh, earlier data uh, suggested that fully covered self-expandable esophageal stents could be placed through the cisgastrostomy tract and left in place to allow uh, subsequent interventions on an as-needed basis. Uh, these stents uh, range from around 18 millimeters in, meters in diameter up to 23 millimeters in diameter. Um, newer stents, uh, including lumen opposing stents, um, can now be placed uh, with a major benefit of uh, single step insertion uh, as well as um, short stent length to uh, maintain the tract without um, damaging the contralateral stomach wall or uh, the contralateral wall of the collection. So here is a, a short video demonstrating uh, cautery enhanced placement of a, a lumen opposing metal stent into uh, an area of walled off necrosis. You can see cautery entry followed by deployment of the proximal flange. Subsequently, the distal flange is deployed and a pigtail stent's left behind. This then allows for repeated necrosectomy uh, even as much as every couple days to resolve the cavity. However, I would submit that the need for direct necrosectomy has diminished um, using these um, stent types. Um, when we compare lumen opposing metal stents to fully covered self-expandable uh, esophageal stents, um, again, the biflange stents can be delivered via cautery um, and, and make this really a one-step process, perhaps a two-step process if the uh, proceduralist deems dilation of the uh, stent is necessary. Um, but ultimately, this uh, is much more um, simplified than compared to repeated uh, dilation uh, stent removal, and then um, a similar approach in each subsequent procedure. Um, when we compare both lumen, uh, lumen opposing stents and fully covered stents that double pigtails, uh, there is a definite advantage in the mean number of procedures to resolution, again favoring ultimately lumen opposing metal stents. Um, a retrospective study uh, from uh, Nagi Reddy's group in Hyderabad, India, of 200 patients uh, demonstrated that the step-up approach using lumen-opposing metal stents, whereby step one was to de declog the lumen-opposing metal stent, followed by placement of a nasocystic tube through the metal stent, then followed in step three, if necessary, uh, with direct mechanical endoscop endoscopic necrosectomy, showed that 96% clinical success with only 9% of patients needing direct endoscopic necrosectomy. Um, and 75% of those patients without any reintervention at all, um, with a very, very low rate of adverse events in 4% in of patients. So in conclusion, the early comparative studies favored minimally invasive interventions over necrosectomy. Um, subsequent studies have demonstrated that minimally invasive endoscopic intervention is superior to the minim minimally invasive surgical approach. 
And I believe that the development of lumen opposing metal stents have further strengthened the role of endoscopic drainage and necrosectomy in the treatment of pancreatic necrosis. Thank you. Thank you, and now we move straight to the next talk, and after that we'll have the discussion and debate on the issue. So another question is that do we need any surgeons anymore for the pancreatic necrosis? And Dr. Matthew Walsh from USA is going to tell us the surgical point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I appreciate all the warm hospitality from all our Polish colleagues and applaud you for staying till the bitter end. Um, you, you raised a question earlier about uh, the role of ERCP and surgeons doing it. We have a lot of surgeons uh, doing ERCP and a, a very good surgical endoscopy group. It has gone down for two reasons. The role of MRCP in diagnosis where you don't need ERCP um, but the other thing that we have not done well as a surgical group is learn EUS. So anything pancreatic, you're gonna ha you can't just be able to do uh, catheter-based things. You have to learn EUS, and there's really a diminished role really in learning that in the United States at least. So uh, let's talk about surgery for necrotizing pancreatitis. I just want to point out that the way Dr. Law and I did this is uh, we decided to start with the case, which you heard presented, and uh, that's the only communication we've had, so we'll have each of our takes on that case. So you heard the case already. Um, there's nothing new here other than, you know, you see for the first time the, the use of the word um, Juan uh, Waldorf necrosis, and although we use timing to, to designate that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So you've already seen the images. Some of the things that I would point out is that there's ascites there as well, and what does that mean? The patient sounds unwell, and the question really is why. That's one of the things we can't forget as we're taking care of a patient. I think the nice thing about presenting a patient together is that it really hones in very specific points for that very specific individual. So what did I think about the case when I got it? Um, it seemed to me that the initial management at the University of Michigan was just fine. Um, we haven't really talked about the cholecystectomy part, which for a surgical audience I think is important. When should that happen? How do you coordinate that with uh, pancreatic interventions? What about the ascites? Why is that there? Is that pancreatic? Is it infected? Is that why the patient's not doing well? Does it point to something about their nutritional status? Um, are we concerned in the end that the patient has pancreatic sepsis as a source of why they're not doing well? And then ultimately I'm asking, what is the rush to do something right now? Even if uh, we end up deciding it should be endoscopic. I think overall, in terms of how we treat complicated, severe acute pancreatitis, of which necrosis is a demonstration, uh, remember that symptoms guide therapy. The presence alone doesn't mean you have to do something. Uh, debridement may be required. Uh, don't forget about a disconnected left duct, which we saw a little bit earlier in the, in the topic today. I think this is really important to be talking about teamwork and I'm gonna try and accentuate that. I don't think it is really surgeon versus endoscopist. I, I got a little cringe when I saw that big X over surgeon. Um, I think this is really multidisciplinary care. Uh, infection often will drive what we do, uh, especially the timing of care, but remember it can also help in the debridement process. It really separates dead from, from healthy. And just like real estate in pancreatic uh, diseases, the location means a lot in terms of uh, what we're able to accomplish. I think controversial aspects then are, uh, we haven't talked about what the role of fine needle aspiration is, do you, should you still do it, the role of uh, timing of cholecystectomy, and then these are the decisions I think if we're going to be interested in surgery, who should do it, 
who should get it, when should it be done, and what are the approaches and access routes that we need to consider. And is there any role for open debridement now? So timing, I think, is important. Obviously, we want to prevent uh, future episodes of gallstone pancreatitis. Um, and the success of la laparoscopic cholecystectomy in pancreatitis may be related to the timing. And my, my bottom line point is that when it depends on the severity of the pancreatitis, if you have mild pancreatitis, you shouldn't delay doing the cholecystectomy. But conversely, if you have severe, like this case, there's no rush. So there, there are some good data, I think, looking at when to do a cholecystectomy in mild pancreatitis. And you'll look, I've tried to highlight here the things that might be important, readmission with recurrent biliary events, conversion to open from laparoscopic and overall complications. It, and you can see down at the bottom, if you pull all the data together, that there's an 18% readmission rate. Uh, the conversion rate is very uh, comparable if you do it early, so no reason to wait. And the complication rate is uh, a little bit less um, if you do it early as well. So I think the, all these data together would suggest that early cholecystectomy is warranted in mild pancreatitis. What about in severe gallstone pancreatitis? Remember, the majority of the damage has already been done. Um, you can't probably uh, make it much worse, but there are some data here from Dr. Neelan's group. And if you just look at the need for some sort of procedure after the cholecystectomy, that as was the rehospitalization and the complication rate if you did it early. So in general, once you have severe pancreatitis, you can sort of coordinate it based on what you need to do on the pancreas, whether they're gonna need a surgical procedure or not, but you don't need to rush and get it done. So who applies to both the patient and the surgeon? or the endoscopist. I think you have to have a competent surgeon from the beginning if you're gonna do this. Uh, too often surgeons get consulted, but then when something needs to be done, that's when they get shipped to my hospital. So it's better off if you're really not gonna be interested in taking care of the complications, then don't get, in, get involved. Same thing with the endoscopist. You can't, it's just not slamming a stent and go. You may have to do multiple procedures. You have to be interested, especially when the patient gets readmitted with a problem. And then who is the patient? This has swung a bit. We used to do, I'll show you this in a minute, but we used to do non-infected necrosis quite commonly, but that isn't so true anymore. Really, it's about infected necrosis that matters. But in sterile necrosis, at least suspected sterile necrosis, usually ongoing organ failure or really a failure to progress should be the reason to intervene. So if you look at these data uh, from Mass General, they were very aggressive in doing non-infected necrosis early on, and you can see that even they have changed. And the, by far the majority of patients who are gonna need treatment, is, it is because the necrosis gets infected. And then the next question is, when should we do it? This is where the Atlanta criteria really help us out. I do think this is a critical aspect in managing these patients to get success. You really want to avoid early intervention, surgery in particular. You have really high operative mortality and morbidity. You really want infection, if it's gonna happen, to occur and let that help you with the demarcation of dead tissue. But by the same token, it's not good to unnecessarily delay operation because that's when you get organ failure, especially when it's infected. And some of those bad results that you saw are probably intervening too late in getting that high uh, organ failure risk. So four weeks is the beginning of when you should start counting the clock in terms of intervening. And then percutaneous route, we haven't really talked about that, but that's really a key element as well especially someone who may have some early infection, you can put a drain in, that will bide you time to get a more walled off collection. And here you can see, this is some data again from the Dutch group, 
and you can see early on, less than 14 days, a really high total mortality rate compared to if you wait a month. And these were some of the data that really drove uh, us to uh, delaying surgery as much, or any intervention, as much as you can. Same thing from this group. Again, mortality rate is uh, single digit. And interestingly, you'll see the time to intervention was 77 days. So it's not necessarily day 31 that something's going to happen. And so this is our case again, and I would just say we don't have a great situation of walled-off necrosis. There's still a lot of acute inflammatory aspects to this patient, unfortunately. It's not really well uh, localized, and so it brings back my question of what's the rush. And then what should you do? In general, debridement is preferred. Let the dead tissue declare itself. That's where the infection helps. There are many operative approaches. Uh, the retroperitoneal approach I'm going to talk a little bit about right now. Um, and then there's some adjuncts that the surgeons can do, uh, not the least of which is often your finger or hydrodissection as well. I think factors that do determine the approach, because this is a moving target, and endoscopy is certainly an important approach. Again, you have to have a dedicated endoscopist. Really having a solitary unilocular collection that's retrogastic is really what's going to succeed very well. Percutaneous drainage is important in our treatment of these patients. Again, you have to have a dedicated radiologist. Often these will take need to be upsized, and where the drain is placed is critically important. Uh, you should put these when you think there's infection, and that's probably also where the role of fine needle aspiration is played. And then the MIS approach, um, you have to have good access to these collections to be able to do it. And I hate to say it, occasionally we still have to do transperitoneal uh, debridements. And so part of this is the surgeon has the widest arg um, array of interventions that they can use. So fine needle aspiration, I'd, I'd be curious how many people use this. This was very common. And uh, Ed Bradley introduced this as really as a way to define who should have intervention. If it was infected, then the patients need to be intervened. So it changed the concept of everybody getting surgery for necrosis. Um, I would say th the pendulum has swung into it's important as to the when. And so since we have an emphasis on delayed treatment, I really don't want to know unless the patient's sick if it's infected or not. And I'm going to, that low-grade infection may help me with debridement later. Um, in cases of pancreatic sepsis, this is again where you put the external drain in, and that typically is going to lead to the step-up procedure, which is a surgical procedure. So the minimally invasive approaches, um, endoscopic obviously is part of that. And my plea would be for multidisciplinary discussions. We do discuss these as a group between surgeons, radiologists, and uh, endosonographers. In our, we have a weekly case conference, so these are discussed. I don't really think it should be someone just deciding to do it. Um, you see all the MIS approaches. The one thing I will say is we don't do this anymore. We don't go transgastric with MIS for a retrogastric collection. This is really a slam dunk for the endoscopist now, so I don't think just doing a transgastric uh, minimally invasive procedure is really necessary. The retroperitoneal debridement aims at minimizing surgical stress by staying out of the abdomen. We use laparoscopes, sometimes endoscopes as well, um, and it's really enhanced by delayed uh, intervention. Uh, and drainage is, is really important, and this is why a drain will not be placed in my hospital for pancreatitis unless a surgeon is involved. And that's one of our little rules. So minimum invasive necrosectomy, uh, remember, who it is done to matters very much, and you have to be careful of the data. You have to have good access. Uh, unilocular collections are ideal, especially ones that go, I think, down into the gutter. Um, and no intra-abdominal pathology that requires open surgery. Laparoscopic is fine, so we'll sometimes do retroperitoneal debridement and the lap coli at that same time. 
not all these patients that get done um, are equivalent to all the patients that are done open. Um, and you have to have percutaneous drainage first, and then that gets dilated to the maximum size that the radiologist can do. At our hospital, that's 28 French, and you may need to do repeat procedures. So the step-up procedure, you did hear this, uh, patient selection is critical. Um, and the location, the number, and upsizing is all important in drains. So here's the ideal drain for this procedure where it's between the kidney and the colon and it's a nice straight shot. So that has to be considered before that first drain goes in, but we often will get a, another drain in as well to help us out. And this is a trial we heard about and you heard the results of, but here's the most important thing, it's that top box and that is that you had 378 patients to get 88 patients. So not everyone is a good candidate for these minimally invasive procedures. There's a whole range of patients and specific problems that may or may not make them ideal for these minimally invasive procedures. And again, you'll see that the results were favorable, but the most important favorable result is the 40% who didn't need anything other than a drain. And a drain, I would suggest, is better than a hole in the stomach. So a lot of these patients, you can start with the drain and that serial drainage, maintaining those drains may be all that the patient really needs. I'm gonna try and show you, I know time is a bit limited here. Just, this is a series of cases that we did and I'm just gonna take it just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, so this is a patient who had you know, terrible necrosis, went down the left gutter, and you can see that we have, I hope you can see pretty well, you have two big drains in place. Having two is ideal because that allows you access both for irrigation, insufflation. This can be done with either a zero degree or 30 degree scope. So, uh, so here we're going to um, insufflate. I'll use the other one to irrigate. The view that you see into the cavity is very uh, analogous to what the endoscopist is going to see as well. Um, and you're going to really upsize these ports. We'll go to a 10 in some cases that I'll show you here. A lot of it's hydro dissection. I can probably get more done in one setting uh, than an endoscopist just because I have more tools to use, which is still a little bit limiting, I think, for the endoscopist. I'm just gonna play this a little bit longer. In the end, I'm gonna end up opening up that lower incision and getting my finger in there. That's gonna help the best. Uh, that's one of the the ways that you can get it done. And, and the patient's lateral here, so this is the superior part towards the head. And again, that's what it's sort of gonna look like. Got some pus, anything that's red, you don't wanna go after. That's why it's nice to have two ports because you can have a working port going in um, as well as uh, the optical port. Like right there, I wouldn't be grabbing. And I'm just gonna, a lot of it's gonna happen not through the port, to be honest. Once I start upsizing and getting my finger in there, you, you'll see a lot more tissue coming out. And this patient, in the end, only had one uh, necrosectomy required. And we put, end up putting in a very soft drain at the end. So these are actually standard laparoscopic instruments. There's nothing fancy in terms of uh, having an Axio stent, which is, I think, $5,000 a pop, by the way. But they're great. Just wanna show you the end of this. So here we're gonna upsize it, and the point here is just using a lot of hydrodissection. I'm gonna use my finger until it's, it's pretty clear. So, here we're gonna put the 10 up and uh, insufflating and with low pressure and irrigating all at the same time is typically what's gonna work great. 
And that's when uh, you have a nice, the point of having walled off necrosis is having a real defined cavity. Okay, we'll let that go. Transperitoneal, you still, I suggest, will need to be able to know how to do this for some patients. There's a lot of nuances in terms of which incision is best. Uh, we're almost always put lavage type drains in that are closed suctioning so we can irrigate. Um, and in this day and age, if you intervene at the appropriate time uh, with delayed therapy, but not with organ failure, you're gonna do well. This would be a typical case. Everything you see that looks like stool is stool because uh, this patient actually had a sigmoid perforation as part of their necrotizing pancreatitis and uh, was shipped to us with that problem. And I'm afraid that's going to take an open necrosectomy to deal with. So who are the people I think primarily are surgical patients, those who have complex factors like they can't come back for care frequently, uh, patients that are anticoagulated that may need debridement. Um, if they have lots of collections that um, you would take a bunch of catheters to take care of. And sometimes you don't want a gastric perforation for nutritional reasons or do you really need a hole in the viscous to take care of the problem. Uh, the only thing I'll say here is just remember to look at the imaging very well. Look out for pseudoaneurysms. You want to know those ahead of time. How you're going to get to certain collections, you have to plan that in advance. And then go for the easiest spot um, at the time, the thinnest point. You might have to aspirate to help you find that. So in the end, gastroenterologists and surgeons, is it really uh, like farmers versus cowboys? That's an expression in the United States. Um, I don't think this is adversarial at all, even though it's a debate, which clearly I won. But, you know, there are critical points that you need to interact at who manages the pancreatitis at the beginning. And then if there's an intervention, what should it be? Should it be radiology first? Should it be endoscopy? Um, so decide what it's going to be before you do something and then figure out at what point and when are, is the, you're gonna have a rescue plan in place for the patient so everyone knows what it is. And then don't forget the underlying ductal abnormality is part of the issue. We wrote a paper on endoscopic management early on for pseudocysts and one of the important things from this paper was initially it depended on who the patient was referred to. If they were referred to a surgeon or an endoscopist, did that direct what happened to them? Unfortunately, it did. So we changed to a fully multidisciplinary group. And then don't forget about a disconnected left duct where you have a recurrent pseudocyst. Um, that's because this end of the duct keeps feeding it. And chances are just dealing with the pseudocyst is not gonna solve the problem. You have to do something to that uh, duct that's not drained. And that's a disconnected left duct. And you can have multiple outcomes. Sometimes uh, repeated drainage may work, but that's usually only a temporizing thing. Um, so if they have pain, because they will stricture off the pancreas as well, then you have to approach the duct. Um, and you just have to think of it in your, that this might happen later on. So my suggestions for this particular patient would be to discuss the plan in a multidisciplinary conference. I would probably aspirate the ascites for, to see if it's pancreatic and see if it's infected. If I'm still worried that the patient has pancreatic sepsis because I don't like how it's walled off, I would probably plan for an external drain. I would make sure that the patient's getting enteral nutrition. That is the single most important thing that will affect their outcome. The randomized data clearly shows that. And I would wait longer in this patient but if I needed to put a drain in, I would anticipate that they would do well with a step-up procedure. So in summary, I think necrotizing pancreatitis is really a surgical disease in the sense that a surgeon needs to be involved from the beginning. Um, I think it's very critically important. Uh, we didn't talk about abdominal compartment syndrome. That's in the early phase. But infected necrosis and failure to progress are important. And there are multiple surgical approaches as well as endoscopy and delayed timing really is important for success. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, for this excellent overview. 
if you would like to join us here on the podium so we can actually start discussing about this thing a little bit. So first question, Ryan, would you, are you sticking to your opinion that there is only endoscopical treatments or did uh, Matthew convince you about the need for surgery as well? Um, well, I think in medicine, there's, there's n the words never and only are rarely applied in general. So um, I think that uh, there certainly is a role for, for surgery. I think that Dr. Walsh makes a great point um, in the sense that um, not all patients need intervention just because there's an intervenable lesion. Um, so I would completely agree that patients who have uh, collections, whether they be pseudocysts or uh, walled off necrosis, if they're asymptomatic and demonstrating no evidence of infection, they should be left alone. Um, especially if they're maintaining body weight, nutrition, and so forth, they really should be left alone. Um, and, and that's the approach at our institution that we take. Just because there's a 15 centimeter collection does not mean it needs to be drained by anybody, um, unless the patient's doing poorly. So I completely agree with that. The other thing um, I would say, you know, from, from our perspective, the benefit of, of the lumen opposing stent is, you know, essentially one procedure with a 15 millimeter or 20 millimeter opening that doesn't require upsize of, of uh, drains by radiology and, and can be, you know, lead to resolution after one procedure and then a procedure to remove the stent. Um, but I, I think that the, you know, in our practice, the role for surgery probably comes into play most in the situations where the collections never really organize. Um, or uh, when it involves the, the, uh, the paracolic gutters. Excellent. So feel free, questions, comments, you can share your own experiences, what your practice in your institutions. So the floor is yours. I, I would just say that we're, we're trying to sort, we obviously have uh, very good and aggressive endoscopist as well. And so we, we would like to help try and answer the question, who should get what? It would be nice if we could figure that out up front. And so we're trying to look at and have the surgeon be able to figure it out or the gastroenterologist just by looking at the CT scan. And so we are actively uh, doing that and trying to figure out really how much down the gutter matters when you have multiple collections, what's the, um, how well are they connected? Because once you drain one, you can sort of get one infected, but that it's not really draining very well. Um, so we're trying to look at all those factors and be able to predict who's going to do the best. I think another important point that Dr. Walsh made that um, doesn't happen enough at many institutions, including uh, tertiary referral centers, um, is the role of radiology and the role of upsizing the drain. So um, this actually is a, a point of contention that I have with our radiologists um, regularly is that they'll put in a drain as an initial procedure, but they'll put in a 14 French drain, and then they'll tell me that the largest drain that they have in-house is only an 18 French drain. And my, my explanation to them is that's not going to help. That may get some of the initial, uh, perhaps infected, fluid component of the collection resolved, but for patients who have a large necrotic collection, um, we really need to be talking about 24 and 28 French drains uh, to really make a big impact. Um, there are some groups around the country who also advocate for the combination of percutaneous large board drainage with uh, some um, internal drainage as well. Uh, whereby one of the sites is used for lavage and irrigation and the other site is used for, for exit. Um, but I think that um, in this, you know, answering the questions that Dr. Walsh proposed, we really need to be, to have our radiologists on board and, and upsizing the drains because I think that that's critically important uh, when they're involved in these cases. Thank you. So Matthew. that's why when you have a multidisciplinary conference, the radiologists have to be there. They have to be part of the solution. And, and they are. Um, you just have to engage them, be relatively nice to them occasionally. Yeah, actually, I enjoyed your concept about having the 
experienced multidisciplinary team to run, run this business. So that's actually one of the main conclude, conclusions of this whole uh, debate and session. So that allows a tailored decision making for uh, all kinds of patients. And uh, then in your institution, it's preferable that you have the combination of our pr uh, approaches available and then you can move from there to the step approach even up to the open surgery as required. I would like to thank the audience, the speakers, and uh, conclude this session and uh, hoping you have a safe flight home. Thank you.